If you have a Bible, as was mentioned, go to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. Maybe I can bring the volume down just a little. It's kind of loud to me. I hate to hear myself talk. <laughs> My wife says that sometimes as well. Uh, the story's told of a, a wealthy man who loved his money, and he was kind of a guy who was religious, but not sure he was really a Christian. And he was nearing the end of his life, and so he decided that he would fill these bags that he had full of as much money as he could, millions of dollars. And he told his wife, he said, look, now, when I die, on my way up to heaven, I want you to, to take these bags and tie them up in the attic on the rafters. And on my way up, I'll grab them. <laughs> she said, okay. So she tied them up there, and sure enough, late one night, he passed away, and his wife that morning ran up in the attic, and the bags were still hanging there. She kind of shook her head and said, I knew I should have put them in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Revelation chapter 18, <laughs> it, it talks about not only the political system of the world that will fall and is judged by God, but also the, the economic system of the world. If you look at verse 1, it says, after these things, after these things. So we, we, we ask ourselves, well, what, what things? After what things? Well, first, we, we go back to chapter 17, and we say after the fail or the fall of the one-world religious system that was called the mother of harlots, which we saw last week in chapter 17. But then another angel, it says, comes down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. This angel comes down with great authority and, and lights up the whole earth. It's brightness. It's, it's obviously a very powerful, authoritative being, that, and it makes a loud proclamation, it says there in, in verse 2. He cried mightily with a loud voice, so everyone's hearing this, and he says, fallen, fallen. It's kind of a double exclamation. And many believe that the reason it's said twice is not only just because of chapter 17 that the religious world has fallen, but also now the economic world begins to fall. Fallen, fallen. The influence and the impact of what lies behind and controls the whole world system of, of money, it says here, is, well, it says it's demonic. Listen to what it says. Every Babylon, the greatest fallen, has become, verse 2, a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, for all the nations have drunk, verse 3, of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It's a picture of greed, of, of satanic control, and it has become, at this point, a global. There, there's a passage in the book of James. I'll just read it to you. It says, Come now, you rich... Weep and howl for your miseries that are come upon you. It's a, James has an end-time perspective here about those who've trusted in their money, who've put their hope in their riches. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. 
Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which, kept, which, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. The cries of reapers have reached the ears of the Lord. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You fattened your hearts as in the days of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just, and he does not resist you. This, this picture in Revelation, and we see all throughout the Scripture, there's this, there's this emphasis and absorption by wealth and luxury that comes to an end. It says in verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven, Revelation chapter 18, saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to the heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you. Repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed. Mix double for her in the measure that she glorified herself. And live luxuriously in the same measure. Give her torment and sorrow, for she says in her heart, I sat as a queen, am no widow, and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she'll be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. In verse 4, there's a call. Look at it there. It says, I heard of another voice Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. A God of justice and a God of mercy. Lovingly calling his people out from Babylon, the ungodly system and, and most likely an ungodly place, demonstrating his justice and his mercy. It's, it's the declaration that Babylon has fallen. And then comes the details of the destruction. But God gives his people a way out, just like he did during the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. He gave them an open door. He gave them a warning. And he's removed the church at this time. It's gone. But the, at this point in Revelation chapter 18, many of those who've come to Christ, who have, have been saved during this tribulation time, receive this call to, to come out of that system, to not be in many ways compromised are lukewarm. There's a, there's a great scripture in, in 1 John, and I'll just read it to you in, in uh, chapter 2. And it's, it's dealing with this, this, this mindset of, you know, com coming out of, of, well, out of the world, out of compromise. And it reads like this. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. You know, it's interesting. You, 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 you look at the world and all that goes on there, and if you've if you've been around for a while, you can you can look back further, and you and you can see different eras of time and things that have have passed your way. I had a guy come up to me yesterday, and he says, "You're a little older than me." I go, "Well, thanks for reminding me of, of that." <laughs> he goes, "No, no, you 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 were, you were around in the '60s, right?" I go, "Sorta." <laughs> and he, he goes, "Well." He says, what do you think's the difference? He says, you know, in the 60s, we had assassinations of presidents. We had uh, racial riots and racial leaders who were killed. You had the big upsurgence of drugs. You had all the, the riots against the Vietnam War, a lot of, a lot of killing, a, a, a lot of violence. He goes, and we have it today. He goes, we have all kinds of shootings and murders and violence. He goes, what do you think the difference is? Is there a difference? Do you think it's worse now than it was then? Because back then, he says, it was very bad. And so we, we started talking about it, and, and, and kind of the, the, the bottom line we came to was this, and I thought it was kind of interesting. 
that in the 60s, there was a, a group of young people all across the nation, really across the world, who, who, who started listening to different music. We said, we're kind of tired of Lawrence Welk. <laughs> could, could maybe we listen to the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and, you know, these guys? And, and they started experimenting with drugs, and they, they grew their hair out, and they didn't want to go to Vietnam, and they protested the war. And they were kind of a, a, a large group across the world, especially in America, who were anti-establishment. Like, you know, we don't want to live this way anymore. We're not going to, you know, abide by the establishment's rules. And I said, but today, kind of what the difference is, it's not so much a, a movement from the ground up as it seems like it's more of something being pushed down. Where you have the leaders now who are saying, oh, no, you've you got to embrace this, this gender thing. You, legally, you, you have to have this in your schools. And, and to me, it's a much more threatening thing than it is the other way around. And, and, and here it comes at us, and I think the, the epitome and the end of it we see in this one world economy and this one world religion that we saw in chapter 17, it's more of coming from up being pushed down into the culture than it is the culture rising up from the ground up. And, and, and this is kind of the, the finality of it here. You, it, it evolves into this one world economy, this one world religion, and and it tells us in, 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 in the book of Ephesians, there's a, there's a great verse that says, uh, as, as God is calling his people out of this, this trap of worshiping self and money, he says, once you, once you were in darkness, but now you're in the light. You, you can see, you can, you can understand the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the, for the fruit of the Spirit is, is in all godliness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out, and this is the path of a Christian, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Because not everything's acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them, for it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things are exposed and made manifest in the light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as a fool, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil." Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Now, now let me have your attention. Listen, I, I want to bring some kind of balance and thought to this idea of come out of the world, be separate, you know, expose darkness. Because we're called to be in the world, right, but not of it. We're called to walk differently. Jesus would tell us in, in Matthew chapter 5, he, he, he says this, You're the salt of the earth, and if it loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing to, but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. And here's, here's what happens in a culture. When, when the church loses its saltiness, when it loses its light, the world runs over it. Because he won't stand up for the truth. He says, you're the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill. You can't hide that light. Nor do they light a lamp, put it under a basket, but on a lampstand so it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. It, it, it's not... Yes, it's separation from the, the ideologies and, and some of the actions of the world, but it's not isolation. You don't become a monk. You don't hide behind the walls of the church. You don't not say anything about what's true. Separation is not isolation. In, in this chapter that we're in, in Revelation chapter 18, it, it says, uh, you know, come out of her. For her sins have reached, verse 5, to the heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. God, God sees everything. He knows everything. He's aware of everything. But the good news for the believer, the good news for those who have believed and received 
And, and I want to make that statement clear. There's a believing, but there's also a receiving of Jesus Christ. The scripture says, hey, the devil believes, but he's never received Jesus Christ as his savior. And there's a lot of people who believe, but who've never received and those who believed and received Christ, th this passage says he sees all the sins of those who don't know him. But for those who do know him, the Bible says their sins are remembered no more. That's some great news right there. As far as the east is from the west, he has re removed them. God, God will judge, it talks about here in Revelation chapter 18. In fact, there in verse 6, it says, Render to her, speaking of Babylon, that, that, that economic one world system, render to her just as she rendered to you and, and repay her double according to her works. And you want to say, wow, double punishment? That doesn't seem just. Well, what's really being said here is, is double punishment for double sin. That, that's, that's the scenario here. You know, she, render her just as she rendered to you. She, she sinned against you doubly. So, so he says, repay her double according to her works. And there's a qualifying statement in there in verse 7. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously in the same measure, give her torment and sorrow, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen. I sit as a queen. She glorified herself. This is the, the system, the, 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 the city, the place, the, the world economic position at that time. What, what, full of pride, full of luxury, full of self, much, much like what the, you saw in the heart of the enemy himself, Satan, when he fell. There's a passage in Isaiah chapter 14, I think we can bring that, talks about Satan when he fell. For you said in your heart, I'll ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the farther sides. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This was a passage, a prophetic passage in Isaiah, kind of describing the fall of Satan, that, that angel that was in heaven. And it's similar to this pride and this glorying of self here by the financial kingdom of the last days here in Revelation chapter 18. Therefore, it says in verse 8, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning, famine, and she'll be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord God who Judges sounds very similar to Sodom and Gomorrah. She'll be burned and and with fire and strong as the Lord God who judges her. And then this this scenario of the Babylon falling continues, and you pick it up here in, in verse nine. The the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, the great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Gold and silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, verse 12, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, incense, fragrant oil, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit of your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which you rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who become rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in linen, purple, and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. 
every shipmaster who traveled by ship and sailors, as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance. They cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like the great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by wealth. In one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heavens, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you all. The, the destruction of the one world economy will affect everyone in one way or another. We, we see the reaction there in verse 9 of, of the leaders of the political system, the kings of the earth. They're talking about all these, these leaders all around the world who represent the leaders of political parties and kings and princes and presidents. Uh, verse 11, that talks about the merchants who are the, the business system. And verse 17, the shipmasters, the, the commercial world and all of its shipping and, and, and all of its... Uh, ways of, of distributing products and produce. Verses 9 and 10, the kings and the rulers are, are, are mourning. It's, it's the, the end of that whole political empire that's propped up by their money. Maybe you remember that great theologian, Nanu Nanu Mork. Do you remember that guy? <laughs> Robin Williams. He defined politics like this. This is not my definition, but it's Robin Williams. He said, poly means many, and ticks means bloodsuckers. <laughs> so you drew the conclusion pretty quickly. Our, our hope is not in a political party or political agendas especially at this time in the world when, when it becomes a one-world sort of economic political system that, that feeds off of the world. They, they weep, it says in, in, in verse 11, and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. This weep and mourn word is interesting. It's really one word that, that means uh, it, it's a word for uncontrolled sobbing and, and crying. Not over the fact that God is judging sin. Not, not over the fact that, that people are, are dying. Not, not because they recognize God is holy and just and they want to repent. No, he, here's what they're crying over. Their money. Their businesses are going under. The, the bottom line of the weeping and the mourning and the uncontrolled sobbing has to do with the love of money. And that's, that's, the, that's what the chapter is exposing, that, that, that this whole thing, and there's, there's like from verse 12 to verse 13 of Revelation chapter 18, there's 28 different commodities that are spoken of. It talks about uh, all of them have to do with wealth and luxury, that's gold and silver and silk and oil and, and, and marble. And then there are two mentioned that really stand out. And it says the bodies of and souls of men there in verse 13. In the time of the apostle John who, who penned this revelation, there was a huge number of slaves and a slave trade in the Roman Empire. It was giant. All the conquered nations by Rome had people who were enslaved by them, and so as you're reading this and you're, you're thinking about this, this whole thing of bodies and souls, does it mean there'll be a return to slavery in the last days? I think sort of, but in a different twist. And, and I think you see it now in, in the cultures around the world and in ours as well as you, as you look into it and see it. It's, um, it. it says the body and souls of men. It could be the human trafficking, which is becoming more and more an issue in our world today. The, the drug trafficking and the legal people that come in and out. Drug deaths are up 15 to 20 percent. The explosion of fentanyl is, is kind of sweeping through the world, especially in, in, our, in our nation now as, as all kinds of drugs are coming across the borders. The legalization of, of entry drugs, I call them entry drugs, 
back, back in the 60s, the entry drug was, was marijuana. You know, everyone said, oh, I'll, I'll do marijuana and I may do a little hashish, but I would never do, you know, anything like uh, LSD or I would never do heroin, I would never do this. But you know what? A lot of people who said that, who started off with this entry drug, went far beyond that. And some of you are sitting here say, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And now it's the entry drugs are legal. The, the bodies of, of, of souls and men, a, a global black market perhaps for children that, that we see exploding in the country and the world and an epidemic of drug use, of, of entry drugs, of abuse of painkillers, it's, it's, epi it's epidemic. There's this, this meltdown of not only economy, it says, for in one hour, verse 17, such great riches come to nothing. You know, when this, this is an interesting passage that when the Twin Towers were hit and were burning and, and everyone was freaking out and all the planes were stopped and pulled out of the sky and the economy was, 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 was plummeting, the stock market, many people looked at this and said, oh my gosh, in one hour, and they watched the towers burn and said, this, this is that passage. Well, maybe a foreshadowing of it, of things like that that can happen. In, in Luke chapter 12, there's, a, there's an interesting passage of Scripture. I don't know if I had that one on there or not, but if not, I can look it up. Luke chapter 12, there's that story, a very familiar story that we, we all have heard many times when Jesus tells this story. And it's in chapter 12, it begins in verse 16. He spoke a parable to him saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, I'll hang my bags in the attic. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> he kind of said that. He said, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? I I'll build a bigger barn and, and a greater one. I'll tear down the old and I'll store my crops and goods. I'll say to my soul, you have so many goods laid up for many years. Hey, just eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, and this is the, this is the identifying uh, word, Fool, that's what he said. If there's anyone you don't want to call you a fool, it's God. <laughs> fool, this night your soul will be acquired of you, and then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So God said, you know what? This guy's a fool. Why should I allow him to continue just to lay up treasures for himself? I, I read a story the other day, a true story about a man who, who had an extreme gambling problem. How many have a gam... No, we're not going to... So, <laughs> so this guy had a really bad gambling problem, and he had a disability. And the IRS accidentally, they weren't supposed to, but they sent him a large check. It was supposed to be kind of funneled through some other system, and, but he got $40,000 check in the mail. And so he cashed it, and he went straight to the casino, and he lost it all. And they realized their mistake, and they realized what had happened, and so they never sent him a check again. They funneled it through another way where it could be used sparingly. And I read that story and I thought, you know what? God does the same thing to people. I mean, if the government does it and recognizes it, certainly God recognizes, I can trust this person to do rightly with money. This other person over here, they're a fool. And so he gives us resources and, and entrusts it into our care and calls us not to be foolish with it. Re Revelation 18 is all about the end of what happens to those who love and worship money and find themselves living only for that. And how in the end times it becomes all about that. Now, now let me stop here for just a moment and define Babylon as it's mentioned here in Revelation chapter 18. Some say it's the revived Roman Empire. 
since Peter and other New Testament writers will use the word Babylon as a code word for Rome because Christians are being persecuted by Rome, and, and so they just use the word Babylon instead of being a direct attack upon the Roman Empire. Some say it's the actual city of Babylon rebuilt on the Euphrates River, which dominates east and west. A place, a very specific place, many say, and a system in place during the final days or end times. Do you decide Rome or the actual city? But it's a city, it's a place, and it's a financial system that, that becomes worldwide and, and dominates the world. And, and it tells us here in, in chapter 18, if you, if you look at verse 20, it says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. He's brought an end to it. Both city and system finished. And the world is weeping. It's mourning uncontrollably in heaven, however, is rejoicing. And often what makes the world rejoice makes heaven mourn. And what makes the world rejoice is just the opposite. It's, it's, it's not that heaven rejoices over death and destruction of the lost and unsaved. I mean, actually, it's the other way around. God's not willing, the Scripture says, that any should perish. But it's rejoicing over the triumph and the victory of righteousness, especially when it mentions here in verse 20 those, those, uh, those prophets and apostles who are rejoicing that finally our, our martyrdom, our, our shedding of our blood has been avenged. Righteousness and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. That, that's what's being rejoiced over, that, that his kingdom has come and now his will will be done. And those who've been persecuted, those who've been killed for their faith will rejoice finally for justice has finally won out. Amen? And here's the picture. The finality of it here in chapter 18. The mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, threw it into the sea, Thus, with violence, the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. Destruction in a single day. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, trumpeteers shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman or any craft will be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you Anymore, The light of a lamp shall not be shining in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, and by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. All the so-called normal life, and this word anymore is mentioned Six times. No music is being played. No, no craftsmen are working. There's no singing. There, there's no preparing of food, uh, which is typified by the millstone, the grinding of wheat. The, the, there's no lighting of a lamp. It's darkness. There, there's no weddings. It, it, it's, it's an interesting time. It's like, it's like Matthew chapter 24, when it talks about the days of Noah, you know, they're eating and drinking and marrying, and then all of a sudden, it, it all comes to an end. But people reject the signs. They, they won't believe it. They, they, they twist the Scripture, and then the end suddenly comes here at this final part of the tribulation. And it's got an interesting verse here, verse 24. And in her, speaking of that city, speaking of that system, was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain on the earth. And you kind of read that and you go, what does that mean, in her? Was this like an autopsy of Babylon? Is this NCIS, you know, at the end? The, the, in her was found. It's, all, it's almost like there's been an examination of what went down in this system, what, what happened in this, you know, final days. And what's revealed here is the blood of prophets and saints. 
And, and what, you know, what, when, you, when you read a chapter like that, of course, you have to ask yourself, um, what's, what's, what's my takeaway? And that's an interesting word, takeaway. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget my first trip to Australia. I was helping out with a conference over there. And even though Australians speak English, <laughs> it's not the same as ours, right? So I go up to buy a fish and chips, mate, and I was going to buy some fish and chips. And I go up this little stand. My wife is in the hotel waiting for me to buy some lunch. I go up to it, and I go, I'll have number two fish and chips. Okay, that'd be takeaway. I go, what? That'd be takeaway. I go, uh, number two, the fish and chips. <laughs> Well, I'll be, I'll be take away. And I'm like dumbfounded. I don't know what he's even saying. He's saying, well, that'd be take away. And I didn't know what he meant. I'm just standing there like a fool. <laughs> and finally he looked at me and said, oh, you're taking it with you, mate. <laughs> and I go, yeah, yeah, I'm taking it with me. So, so, so this will be take away right here. <laughs> Listen for just a second. In the book of Romans, chapter 2, <laughs> this is our takeaway. We know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those things who practice, against those who practice such things. Do you think, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Are you who despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing the goodness of God, truly leads to repentance? So God is good, but he's also a God of justice. He's a God of mercy. And he calls us to, to not be out of the world, to be in it, but to be a light, to be a salt, and to recognize that our hope is not in politics, it's not in money, it's not in riches. Our hope and our trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ, who will one day judge both the living and the dead. And we live in a time frame that's different than it was in the 60s. We live in a time frame that, that I believe is, is, is very much rushing towards an end time scenario. We, we, we watch the news, you know, we, we're all caught up in this, this Senate election right now, wondering what's going to go down. But we're also at the same time watching, you know, uh, what's going over here with, with Putin, what, what's happening in, in Iran, and what, what's going on in North Korea, and, and this buildup of nuclear arms, and, and we're watching the stock market go up and down, and we're wailing and moaning, and all the things that are happening. And at the same time, we have to focus our heart and mind and say, okay, God's called me to be salt and light. He's called me to be not of the world, but in the world. And to constantly draw myself through his help and the power of his word and his spirit into a relationship with him that allows me to walk in the truth, to speak the truth, and to hopefully, in the, in the, in the very, whether we believe it or not, in that very brief little segment that we have called life, to not be a fool. To know that one day we'll stand before him. And, and as someone I was talking with earlier said, what we're hoping to hear is, hey, well done, Amen. good and faithful servant. Amen?